God needs some answers, thank God for the scriptures. Let's turn to Matthew chapter number 10. Now, I am, many of you know, we've been working on a, a, a sermon series on stewardship. And uh, whenever these kinds of incidents happen, I make a particular effort to go uh, directly to the lectionary. The lectionary is one of these tools that has been given to the church to help us express uh, our greatest and deepest uh, kind of structure of liturgical worship. It structures the scriptures in a very kind of uh, uh, routinized manner so we are not uh, just uh, preoccupied and taken aback by all the things that only we want to talk about. If I preach what I wanted to talk about every week, you probably hear the same sermon over and over again. Somebody say amen, right? Amen. Uh, but the scriptures are wonderful in that they always give to you and I a fresh word from the Lord. Uh, Matthew chapter, uh, uh, I believe it's uh, 15. I said 10, I'm sorry. Matthew chapter, I believe it's, yeah, 15. Matthew chapter 15. Verse 21, so sorry about that. <laughs> Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. Give you a few seconds to turn those three pages over. Praise God. <laughs> All right, Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. And the word of the Lord says this. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting. So for all of you Bible students, uh, you know that the Canaanites were a, uh, a uh, 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 kind of African descent tribe. They were uh, in the, the, the region of Phoenicia uh, and uh, Syria. Uh, so this was a culturally mixed, racially mixed, if you will, area of the country, uh, of the region. They were not Jewish. They were considered Gentiles, so here you have a dark-skinned woman from another country, uh, dare I say, an immigrant, uh, someone who in many respects uh, encapsulates and, and, and really uh, embodies many of the categories of marginalization uh, that many of us are often experiencing. This Canaanite woman came from a region and came out and started shouting to Jesus, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. His answer was, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. Thank you, God. So we're going to spend some time working through somewhat of a complex and uh, difficult pa passage, but I believe it matches the very complex and difficult moment we're in today. And I'll speak simply from the title, Everyone Will Have Their Day. Amen. Everyone will have their day. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Come on, tell your neighbor, everyone will have their day. <laughs> now, I was immediately uh, brought to this uh, quote. It came from the front of my mind when I was pulling this sermon together. Some of you may have saw it on my social media. Uh, Tony Montana, amen, in his, uh, one of his uh, movies says something like, every dog will have their day. Yeah. I mean, you've heard that before, right? Yeah. Every dog will have their day. Urban Dictionary defines this as an expression stating that even the lowest and unluckiest among us will one day have their glory. It is this observation 
an anecdotal observation, but still one that is grounded, I believe, in people's experience. That trouble won't last always. But how many know when you're going through trouble, that does not offer you the kind of... Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Walter Mosley wrote in one of his books that I'm just a survivor from the train wreck of the modern world. And early this week, I must admit that I, and maybe some of you felt like I did, I was barely surviving the train wreck, the most recent train wreck of this modern world. A world where some lives are worth more than others. A world where justice seems to be outmaneuvered by power and Machiavellian machinations. A world where the practices of Christian faith seem to stand in deep contradiction from the practitioners of Christian faith. A world where I was remembered or reminded of the words of W.E.B. Du Bois when he asked the great question, how does it feel to be a problem? What do you do when disappointment, anger, frustration, and disillusionment are your lives. What do you do when you feel like the psalmist writer when he says, my soul, why are you so disquieted within me? My soul, why are you so restless? My soul, why are you so filled with anxiety? When I get to these lowest moments, I do a combination of several things to try to help keep me centered. First thing I definitely try to do is I try to talk to God. Yeah, amen. Then I try to talk to some of my elders who have good wisdom. Because yeah, how many know sometimes not all elders' wisdom is created equal? Amen. I try to read my Bible. Some literature, philosophy, theology, trying to get another take on what's happening. Why? Because the scripture reminds all of us that there is safety in the multitude of counsel. That when you talk to folk and get your own thoughts, interacting with someone else's thoughts, they may help you get to a better place than if you were to keep your thoughts all bottled up inside of you. Earlier today, because I want to, I want to suggest that some of us are too alone with our thoughts. Amen. That's why we constantly find ourselves in a predicament and a situation. Somebody amen. say amen. amen. It is in this council that I believe we draw on what we are to do when the world is crumbling down around us. What does God have to say about this situation? What has history shown us? What is our role in partnering with God to make all things new? Several years ago, many of you were here and you heard me speak uh, on this hoodie theology. How many were here for that sermon several years ago? Amen. We talked a little bit about what does it mean for us to imagine working with God to redeem our world? And, and I, 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 I was, I was, I was challenged to go back and retrieve some of that uh, because I, 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 I thought that rather than always uh, reconstructing, sometimes we should build upon that which we started. And how many of you know that being a problem is nothing new in human history and even in our biblical text? There are some people who are considered to be a problem. There have always been people who have been in society's, by society's standards, uh, struggling and wrestling with this question of finding purpose and meaning from painful experiences. If I were to even go further this morning, I want to submit to you that this is not the first time any of us have had to wrestle with this question of what does it feel like to be a problem. Some of us have had to come face to face with the struggle and purpose, uh, the struggle for purpose and meaning. I've shared how even in my own life I've had to deal with uh, these instances of abuse and, and trauma at the hands of police. 
police officers and how my, my abuse at their hands has continued to be something that I live with every single day. Some of us have had our own kind of struggles that, that, that are just under the surface and they're percolating and, and, and we don't even know that they're there until something happens. And it brings it all back. During an interview I was doing this week, I was trying to articulate how people's behavior can become so quickly uh, riotous and unrestful and, and even violent. Uh, because even if you don't agree, you must seek to understand. Yes. Even if you don't endorse, you have to figure out the why if you're going to move from a place of pain to a place of healing. Yeah. And then a place of of healing to a place of power. Dr. King says uh, that, un that he understood riots and civil unrest as the voice of the unheard in our society. And in cities across the country, listen to this, 30 people are killed every single day by gun violence. And at least one of these individuals are always an African American or a security officer every single day. Not to mention the dozens who are stopped, harassed, physically manhandled, abused and traumatized like I was and then sent home without an apology and acknowledgement of any wrongdoing. I was explaining on the interview that that's like taking a bottle of Coke and shaking it fever, feverishly and then shaking, shaking, shaking it and then taking the cap off then all of it shoot out the top. Uh, me and my wife, we were taking our, our baby uh, daughter, Sarai. I guess she's not that much of a baby. Well, she's five. She's still a baby. She's going to be a baby a long time in my life. Somebody say that, right? We were taking her to kindergarten yesterday, her first uh, welcome back day. And they had these bottles of Coke outside playing for the kids to play games. And they were glass bottles of Coke sitting out in the hot sun, they were trying to throw rings on them, and they just kept knocking the bottle over and putting it back up, and knocking the bottle over and putting it back up, and knocking the bottle over and putting it back up. And I'm sitting there scratching my head right now, uh, I am not a scientist, but I think that may have a problem, and no five minutes after me and my wife observed that, the bottle with no one around just exploded. Yeah. Because it was in the heat. Yeah. It was shook up. Yeah. And the bottle couldn't control what was on the inside of it any longer. Right. I think that some of us have such unresolved feelings and issues uh, that when certain things happen, they flood back to the front of our minds. And even without our permission or our control, they bring us to rage and even on the verge of losing control. And this is the rage inside many oppressed people by necessity that is bottled up and channeled in different kinds of positive ways. Be, because we know we have to be constructive and we have to work on uh, improving our conditions. But sometimes these things can reach a tipping point and I believe in our country, this is where we are. And I tell all my agnostic friends, I uh, said, you know, I know you don't believe in God, but you better be glad most of us poor folk do. Amen. Amen. You have a whole lot of problems. This country be simmering, amen. If we, if we didn't have you, you ought, you ought to tell you that. You, you better be glad I believe in God. Tell them that, amen. Because if I didn't believe in God, you have one angry somebody on your hands. I wish I had an honest church in here today. If you were to keep it real, your tipping point may not be Ferguson. It may not be uh, the Trayvon Martin tragedy. It may be your divorce. It may be your child's health, it may be your stress, your daily pressures, your pain of being alone. I believe all of us have been abused and traumatized and overwhelmed by decisions or the irresponsible actions of others. So while the history of our country manifests this racialized nature of oppression and the conundrum that the dark-skinned body presents for our modern social imagination, we must not underestimate how even our own stuff can cause you and I to get to a place where we feel like God has forsaken us and God has walked out on us and we can't be the kind of person God will call us to be. I'm here to tell you today that even you and even your worst situation, God is saying that your day is coming. Yes. Amen. Amen. The question we must soon challenge ourselves to pivot from is not why did this happen, but how can I make this that has been meant for my 
my evil become a stepping stone for the glory of God to be revealed in my life. You see, in the religious narratives in general and the biblical witness in particular, we have characters like Job who wrestle with the why do bad things happen to good people? We have figures like Esther who experience all the privilege and the wealth of being able to be in the king's palace, but is constantly being uh, confronted with the struggles of her people. And she's hanging out with the king, and she's the king's boo. <laughs> then she looks out over her kingdom and sees that her own people are still struggling. Yes. I know some of y'all ain't living in the king's palace yet, praise God. Y'all not, you know, hanging with your queen and you're not on top of the world. But how many know if you live in America, you got some privilege? Yes. And you, we can't just rest on our privilege and ignore the struggles that are happening all around us. We witness in the biblical text the stories of Moses and Deborah, David and Rahab, and we get a clear, consistent opportunity to see that the scriptures, listen, do not uncomplicate or reduce human suffering. But rather they show us that for those who make themselves available to the surprising work of God, we can be overcome. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I can be an overcomer. Say that. I, I can be an overcomer. And I was lamenting earlier this week with one of the elders. I was saying how I felt like I was born in the wrong era. You hear folks say it all the time. I, if I was in the slavery times, I would do this. Yeah. I would never do that. Told me, talk to me like that. I would never let nobody talk to me like that. If I was in the civil rights era, I would do this. Folks are upset and disappointed with President Obama about what he did say and what he did not say. Talking about what they would do if they were the president. Right, right. Uh -huh. Guess what? You're not the president. Yeah. Then you'll never be the president. Right. I hate the first Joe Bubba. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I wish President Obama would lead a national conversation on race. Yes. Yeah. I wish the president would make a mandate to demilitarize local law enforcement agencies. I wish the president would make sure every unarmed American citizen killed by the police would receive a federal investigation. Yeah. If I were president, I would do a whole lot of different things. Right. So obviously I've been thinking about that too. <laughs> but you know, I have to wake up every day and ask myself the question, since I'm not the president, okay. what am I Yeah. When was the last time I voted? When was the last time I volunteered in the schools or in the church justice ministry or in any kind of thing that didn't revolve around me? That's right. And in our world, and it requires a life-giving response from those. 
emotions, which it produces in faithless acts. Let me say that again. That bad theology produces unfaithful Christians, which inspires faithless acts. Meaning that what you believe about Jesus should deeply inform how you follow him. Lord, I wish I had a church in here today. This text gives you and I a powerful sense of what I believe is inevitable for any follower of Jesus who can stay committed to the fullness of God's reconciling power in the world. Remember, child of God, that God didn't save you so you can just get fat and obese with all of your blessings. But God gave you a blessing so you can be a blessing to somebody else. Because Jesus could have walked around holier than thou, like some of us be trying to act. You know, like our stuff don't stink, you know, and, and, and like we just got it all together. How many of you know that Jesus was qualified to be that kind of a person? Uh, if anybody could have his nose in the air, it could have been Jesus. Uh, if anybody could wait for everybody to wait on them, it could have been Jesus. Uh, but Jesus engaged. In such a way that he interacts with people and even when it feels like it's a challenge, God knows how to come out on the other side and bring victory and liberation. This woman who does not share the cultural background or the religious background or the geographical background of Jesus has this encounter and it brings to the front, listen, what I believe all of us are constantly aware of, that our society structures difference uh, and it structures those things that we are not alike by and it causes us to, to be actors and players uh, in this enterprise whether we know it or not. Uh, I want you to know that some of us are playing a part in somebody's story uh, and some of us are more aware of it than not. Uh, some of us are really aware that we bougie you know and we don't want to be around them kind of folk uh, and some of us don't even know Or it felt like he 
lecture on the silence of God. It was called the dark night of the soul. It, it was this, this struggle that sometimes you can try to engage with God, but God can seem like he is far from your reach. But it is in these moments where you are tempted to stop calling and seeking out God that you must go deeper and turn to him even the more. Why? Because is there any other help than in the name of God? Is there any other power that can deliver you other than God? Is there any other hand that has the ability to reach down to your lowest point and pull you out other than God? This woman was not uh, driven by the divine silence, even though there were haters around the disciples. Uh, could you, don't, don't you wish haters would just sometimes just, <laughs> and you're not dying, but just disappear. Like, Jesus uh, to respond to her need yeah, and not to her 
situation. I want you to know, child of God, that your hope is in this. That if you and I can learn to lean into the hardships of our world, not retreat to our corner where we're around people who are more like us. Because how many of you know that when you are around conflict, you are more prone to go to the corner where people agree with you? But I know I, there are a lot of folks I wanted to unfriend on Facebook this week. Amen. I want no, no, no. You can't be my friend the way you're talking on this Facebook. Praise God. But could it be that as a follower of Jesus, you and I are called to lean in yeah. to some of this stuff? Why? Because in our leaning in, we bring about redemption. I dare some of you just where you're sitting just to start leaning in a little bit. Lean forward. Come on. Lean forward as a metaphor, as an exercise, and say, This week I will lean in to what God is calling me to do. Because in the leaning in, I believe you begin to resist the narrative that would try to diminish us. In leaning in, I believe you and I can become the people God wants you to be. That's why I'm leaving on a plane in a couple hours to go to Ferguson. Because I'm trying to lean in on behalf of all of us. Yeah, yeah. I want us to be there on the ground. So we're not just looking at it through the tube. But you can say that I am there and I am leaning in. Yeah, yeah. And some of you won't be able to go to Ferguson. But guess what? You can go to East Oakland. Yeah, yeah. You can go to the schoolhouse. You can go to your relationship. You can go to that counselor. You can lean in. Come on, everybody. Lean in. One more time. Lean in. Second chances and yeah. to redemption, but all you need to do is lean in and declare, I am better than this. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. And then the last thing that the scripture says uh, is that you gotta be able to work your faith. Somebody holla, work your faith. Work your faith. Uh, this woman, her faith was able to cut through every obstacle and bring the healing that she needed. Jesus acknowledged her faith and says, Woman, your faith is great. Your request is granted. Your faith can cut through every circumstance, no matter what it is. The question is, are you cultivating your faith? Your faith is more than just a Sunday-only exercise. Your faith is more than you just showing up for a couple of songs on Sunday and a sermon on Sunday. But how many of you know you got to work on your faith 24 hours a day? Seven days a week. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 it says to this add to your faith goodness uh, and to your goodness knowledge and knowledge self control and self control endurance and endurance godliness and godliness mutual affection and mutual affection love uh, you got to work your faith uh, even when your faith ain't working for you Damn. Lord I have a quiet church in here today yeah. Yeah. but tell your neighbor I got to work my faith uh, the Bible says Every dog has their 
all of us the people of God. What are you prepared to do, my brother and my sister, to make sure that even though bad things are going to keep happening, your posture inside of the bad things is bearing witness to the saving power of God. And so folks just say, I am an overcomer. I am an overcomer. I am an overcomer. On the screen, I've tried to put a few questions up that may help you think through this next phase or moment. Perhaps the challenges of this week in this season of your life is making it difficult for you to keep seeking and calling out to God. I want to submit to you, my brother and my sister, to reflect where are you challenged in this way. Use this as an opportunity for a confession. This is getting in my way. This part of my life is getting in my way. But God, I want to give this to you today. Where in my life do I need to lean in? My instinct is to lean out when I hear things that I don't agree with. My instinct is to bail out when situations come that are too hard for me to deal with and understand. But with the power of God, I can, you can, we can. Why is leaning in so important? Because as you lean in, you give opportunity for the whole thing to be redeemed. Yes. Where in my life do I need to be more explicit about making sure justice is righteousness? Making sure that truth is proclaimed. That truth, that justice is righteousness. Righteousness is justice. They're not two different things, but they're the same thing. Where do I need to make that proclaimed more broad? Finally, how do I need to work my faith? What do I need to add? I need to add character and goodness to my faith? I have this belief in Jesus. I have this belief in God. I have this belief in salvation. But is that enough? God calling for some of us to add some things to our faith so we can be mature Christians. Stay with me, everyone. Let's take a few moments here.